Hello uh, and welcome. My name is Jennifer Jiha Chun, and on behalf of the International Institute at UCLA, it is my great pleasure to kick off today's event, Abolitionist and Emancipatory Futures, Anti-Racist Struggles and Climate Justice, with our distinguished guests, Professor Vishwa Sadgar and Professor Malini Ranganathan. Today's event is part of a year long series inspired by the groundbreaking Black Lives Matter movement and the political urgency of ending police brutality and racial injustice, both in the US and around the world. When our planning for this series first began last summer, we were in the midst of an historic uprising as tens of millions of people took to the streets against the backdrop of a raging pandemic. Over six months later, we are still battling the deadly coronavirus, while also contending with the toxic connections between systemic racism and white supremacy, you know, albeit with some hopeful new directions uh, in the sphere of formal politics. Today, we turn our attention squarely to the question of climate justice and its intersections with the global movement for Black lives and ongoing struggles against racial capitalism. Before we get to the main event, I wanted to offer some brief words of acknowledgement and gratitude. First and foremost, the International Institute at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional land takers of Tavangar, the Los Angeles Basin, and South Channel Islands. I wanna thank our wonderful team at the International Institute for their vision and dedication in putting together this collaborative series, which is really the first of its kind. Special thanks to Senior Associate Vice Provost, Chris Erickson, and Vice Provost for International Studies and Global Engagement, Cindy Fan. Um, the, you know, the fantastic organized team that put together this series, Lori Hart, Jorge Martirano, Rob Irby, Shana Potts, Ippolitos Califanos, Alden Young, and Erica Anjam. And of course, um, the wonderful staff at the International Institute without whom events like this would not be possible. Katherine Paul, Peg McKerney, Kaya Mintasabu, Alex Zhu, Oliver Chen, Chloe Huga, and Stephen Acosta. Thanks also to our event co-sponsors, the African Studies Center, the Institute for the Environment and Sustainability, and the Departments of Ge Geography, Political Science, and Urban Planning. Our conversation today will be organized in two parts. First, we will hear presentations from our distinguished guests, followed by a round of curated conversations with our esteemed moderator. Uh, then we'll open up the discussion for a public Q&A. Uh, and many of the attendees today are from my course uh, in International Development Studies, Culture, Power, and Development, and we've given them priority in the queue. Uh, so students out there, uh, you know, um, hopefully you'll hear your questions asked. And also we invite attendees to ask their questions, uh, type them in the webinars Q&A, um, and, you know, we'll do our very best to get to them in the time that we have. So now, without further ado, I am really thrilled to introduce our panelists. And for time's sake, um, after my introduction, I will post their full bios and in the group chat. Uh, and I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Professor Malini Ranganathan from American University will talk to us today about abolition and climate justice in transnational perspective. Her intersectional, decolonial, and anti-racist lens provide indispensable insight to understanding really foundational questions about social and environmental injustice, both in the US, and she's you know, in the belly of the beast in DC, uh, as well as uh, what she calls the other DC, which she'll speak to us about today, as well as India, where she's done extensive field work. Professor Vishwa Satgar from the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa, Wits University, is a longtime activist in national liber liberation struggles, the editor of the acclaimed Democratic Marxism series, and one of the most important public intellectuals in leading the struggle for food sovereignty and climate justice. Um, and he'll talk to us today about really the um, uh, the impressive um, work uh, and movement gains uh, around the South African uh, cl Climate Justice Charter. His talk today is entitled, Southern Africa is Burning, Strategic Disruption and the South African Climate Justice Charter. 
Our moderator, Professor Kian Go, uh, right here from UCLA's planning department, will bring her crucial expertise on the spatial politics of urban, urban climate change responses uh, across North America, Southeast Asia, and Europe. So please join me in welcoming them today. We're all from different time zones um, and it's just really wonderful. Uh, we struggle with the difficulties of Zoom, but we also have the opportunity to come together in spaces like this. So without further, further ado, ado, Professor Ranganathan will start us off. Thank you so much uh, to Professor Jennifer Chun for organizing this really exciting and urgent conversation. And thank you to my friend, Professor Kian Go for moderating the session and really all your thought leadership on climate and urbanism and design. And, and finally, thank you to Professor Vish Satgar, my fellow panelist. It's really terrific to meet you and I'm looking forward to hearing about your work and exploring our intersections. So the flurry of executive actions over the past two days uh, to begin to undo the damage of the last four years is, I think we can agree, um, a welcome start. But many of us are cautious about this moment. Abolitionists have long reminded us that change does not come primarily from the ballot box, nor does it come from the kind of status quo reformism that we just voted in. And most worryingly, we might have narrowly voted Trump out, but we certainly didn't vote Trumpism out. I speak to you today from Washington, DC, where January 6th, the siege of the Capitol is ever present on our minds. It was a sobering reminder of the enduring logic of white violence, as well as the monopoly that the racial state has on notions of criminality and violence in the first place. As the world watched the spectacle of fascism unfolding amidst those hallowed edifices of American empire, the Capitol dome, the Senate floor, the oil paintings glorifying the American revolution, the other DC was left in the shadows. Indeed, you don't have to look far to understand the workings of American empire. You just have to look east across the banks of the Anacostia River towards seven and eight. Across the Anacostia, which gets its name from the Nacochtank Native Americans, the northeastern and southeastern shores signify what happens when a colony is ruled without statehood and without representation. About a decade ago, my colleague and comrade Eve Bratman wrote an article in the journal Third World Quarterly titled Developments Paradox DC as a Third World City pointing out the starkly unequal outcomes between DC's Western and Eastern halves. In it, she also problematized constructs of and comparisons with the so-called third world. Indeed, the severity of the racial equity gap in DC, an internal colony, is uniquely American. Third world metaphors only serve to obscure this fact. Now in the wake of the US's singularly colossal failure in COVID governance, its systemic corruption of the highest order and its ethno-nationalist violence, comparisons to the third world are trite at best. At worst, they are misguided and absolve accountability. So Eve and I teamed up to investigate the conditions in East DC that give rise to climate change vulnerability. After Hurricane Sandy, Katrina, Maria, and Harvey, we knew that it was those who were already disinvested in, those who were already experiencing the structural violence of racism and colonialism, who bore the greatest brunt of the disaster and its afterlives. So we were interested in the questions, what are those conditions in DC, a historic black city, which was once the seat of anti-slavery activism? But we also knew that across the US, cities were investing in glossy climate resilience plans. What Joshua Long and Jennifer Rice have argued are neoliberal fixes to overlapping crises of accumulation and ecological danger. DC was no exception to this climate urbanism fix, having published its first climate readiness plan in 2016. So our other questions were, what did these plans do? Whose knowledge and history were valued? Where was the money going? And it was in the context of researching these questions that abolition emerged as a historically 
situated and pragmatic program for reimagining climate justice. Abolitionist climate justice, as we define it, seeks to dismantle infrastructures of racial violence that predispose certain groups to social and environmental vulnerabilities while reinvesting in infrastructures of care, repair, and life. In the rest of my comments, I will think climate and abolition together from DC and then sketch convergences between these two political imperatives beyond DC. Ruth Wilson Gilmore defines racism as, quote, the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, end quote. In a 2020 intercepted podcast that you should all listen to, guest hosted by Chenjerai Kumanika, Gilmore says that as an abolitionist, the question she returns to again and again is, what is it that makes people vulnerable? What is it that makes people vulnerable? She tells the story of ex-Black Panther activist, Michael Zinzen, who having spent his life dedicated to fighting police brutality in Los Angeles, turn to the puzzle of why so many in LA's public housing suffer and even die from asthma, an entirely preventable disease. The reasons, deferred maintenance, rodent and roach infestations, mold, in a word, disinvestment. Gilmore says, and I quote, Zinzin became an environmental justice activist because the environment within the living spaces for these young people was literally killing them. And so he became, as it were, a model for what I imagine abolition to be today." End quote. So Gilmore's framework of racism as state-produced vulnerability maps really nicely onto critical analyses of climate and environmental injustice. The concept of climate vulnerability, for instance, developed most usefully by political ecologists, starts not from the place of extreme weather, causing harm and destruction per se, but rather from the place of a climate event like a hurricane or a heat wave or a flood intersecting with historically forged relations of power manifest in place. So we looked and studied those underlying conditions, those relations of power manifest in place that predispose people to intersectional environmental and social vulnerability, many of which are the very same conditions that predispose people to the worst effects of COVID-19. Over the last year, we've heard the medical community talk a lot about COVID's so-called comorbidities, i.e. those underlying conditions that hasten the virus's most virulent effects. In many ways, by studying climate injustice, we were actually decentering climate change. And this is a really, really important methodological research and theoretical point. We sought to decenter climate change as the be all and end all of all causal drivers and recenter the analytic of underlying vulnerabilities. What we found will in part come as no surprise to a Los Angeles audience. Climate vulnerabilities east of the Anacostia where life expectancy is 27 years lower than the richest ward, where black households have 81 less, 81 times less net worth than white households and where the per capita death rate from COVID is the highest in the district, stems from the compounding effects of high rates of asthma, much like Michael Zinzen found in LA, exposure to highway pollution, little green cover, food insecurity and diabetes, crumbling housing and medical services, poor public transit connectivity, the lack of personal vehicle ownership, unemployment and the looming threat of eviction among other intersectional vulnerabilities. But it doesn't end there. And this is where we have to think carcerality and climate together. One of the most startling statements I heard during the course of field work was from a local Ward 7 organizer in DC who I interviewed in 2016, Angela Doyne. Angela said, quote, I don't know if you know this, um, but they hire more police in Ward 7 and 8 over the summer. They intentionally do more policing in the summer because that's when the youth are out. So these issues run real deep, end quote. So you can play this out in your head just for a second. Imagine, for instance, a code orange day declared by the city. A code orange day is an excess heat event that increases surface ozone levels. 
in all cities in America. Not only are youth living in Anacostia in Ward 8 more susceptible to be policed on a typical summer day because more police are deputed, but a code orange day could also be a death knell for someone living with asthma in dilapidated housing who can't get to their inhaler or health center in time. Because of austerity measures, there are no trauma centers to deal with medical emergencies east of the Anacostia River. Audrey Lord's oft quoted sentiment there is no such thing as, single issue as a single issue struggle because we do not live our lives in single issue ways is at the heart of how we can think vulnerabilities to climate, COVID and carcerality together. These are landscapes of, as Gilmore has termed it, organized abandonment, where over-policing is presented as the solution to state disinvestment and historical trauma. For Laura Polito, Environmental racism is constituent of racial capitalism and operates through certain places and people being designated as sinks. This is the word she uses, sinks, for pollution and toxicity so that others can be valued. I think we can think of abandonment and sinks as relational mechanisms. You have to have abandonment in order to have accumulation elsewhere. You have to have sinks in order to have valuation elsewhere. And you can see and feel the presence of abandonment and sinks here. As you turn the corner on Benning Road in the Kenilworth neighborhood of Ward 7, far from the grandeur of Northwest DC, you can see a decommissioned Pepco coal-fired power plant and the illegal dumping of junk cars and furniture. Behind an aging middle-class black neighborhood, you can also see a now-capped open burning incinerator, the notorious Kenilworth landfill. Laced with dioxins and other carcinogens, the soil under the landfill has yet to be remediated. And I'm now doing follow-up research with a student on the Kenilworth remediation in the context of a climate vulnerable landscape. So what I wanna stress is that organized abandonment derived from abolition scholarship on the one hand, and the notion of sinks derived from environmental scholarship on the other hand, often coexist in place and are relational um, with other geographies of accumulation. Across America and the world, those most gutted by austerity are also those places of incarceration, over-policing, and toxicity. And if you're interested in this linkage between mass incarceration and environmental injustice, um, check out the Prison Ecology Project, which lists these coexisting processes, coexisting um, um, processes of mass incarceration and toxicity, um, not just in the US, but also in the world. And I think it's a real interesting frontier of research. But as we know from calls to shut down prisons, defund the police, stop caging children, and halt new prison construction, abolition is not simply about breaking down structures of oppression and disrupting the logics of racial violence. It is also about building anew. As Du Bois put it, it is not just a negative project, it is a positive one too. This past summer, as Jennifer opened with, of protest expressing outrage at police killings, saw bold and fresh articulations of causes common to both abolition and environmental and climate justice, particularly by youth-led BLM and BYP 100 activists, as well as local chapters of Sunrise, DSA, DC protest, and March for Our Lives. We saw expressions of these intersectional articulations in our research too. Angela, the activist whom I spoke about earlier, introduced me to Bruce Parnell, a trauma counselor and youth mentor. Parnell is a fifth generation of abolitionist, literally comes from a family of abolitionists. His ancestors on whom I wrote a news media article in 2019 titled, A Legacy of Abolition and Love in the Work of a Washington DC Organizer, were station masters in the Underground Railroad in the 1800s. I visited him in his East DC office in the summer of 2019. In his box of old family photos that he took out to show me, Bruce had carefully preserved portraits of his ancestors, John and Mary Jones, the 19th century black abolitionists from Illinois, and Mary Ann Shad, the black Canadian abolitionist who harbored and channeled fugitive slaves into Canada as a station master. Parnell's activism in DC's Ward 7 insists on healing de-escalation, this is the term he uses, and transformative justice as key abolitionist tenets for moving forward. He said to me, and I quote, I don't think anybody's healed from these things, he said, specifically referring to the new Jim Crow and the war on drugs. 
or healing. It's a process. We're moving towards liberation and freedom, end quote. Parnell's focus is on teens and senior residents, two spectrums of what he deems to be the most vulnerable residents. Weekly, he brings seniors together under his program called Soul, Seniors Offering Unconditional Love. He does this to strengthen mutual aid and food networks, which are especially valuable during inclement weather events. He cultivates what he refers to as transformative justice spaces and brave spaces for victims and perpetrators of violent harm in order to scale back the need for intervention by police and the criminal justice system. He builds know your rights literacy, focusing on tenant protection and accessing core government services. His work of his organization has also brought attention um, by DC authorities to lead poisoning in the water because according to him, lead is trauma. Angela told me that one cannot overstate the importance of Bruce's work in building climate resilience. Bruce doesn't frame his work as climate, but it is climate work, she said. To me, that struck me as an important point about how we can locate this kind of work outside of the rubrics of liberal environmentalism. She went on, quote, experts are always coming in from the outside with plans for making us resilient, but what are people actual doing, actually doing? Shouldn't they start there? End quote. That's when it struck me that the work of abolition is the work of climate justice. So in conclusion, I want to move to summarizing some key convergences between abolition and climate justice, both from the vantage of my research, but also beyond. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna share my screen um, because I've been thinking through this um, table um, for a while now, and, and you can see my the table, right? The abolition climate justice table. Okay, so this is this is necessarily experimental, and as Craig Gilmore says, abolition itself is experimental, and and, and these things are, are are emergent in some ways. But um, what I have is two columns: abolition on one side and climate justice on the others, and these are anchoring concepts and convergences. So each row represents particular convergences, right? Um, by by theme. So first, um, while I think the analytics of racial capitalism um, has, has always been an anchoring concept for scholars of abolition. Critical environmental scholars have also started bringing the mechanics of racial capitalism to bear on environmental analyses. And, and, and in a parallel move, indigenous scholars like Kyle White have pointed out the long history of settler colonialism and climate induced harm. Abolitionists are also connecting their, their demands to the history of stolen land. In fact, there was an event at UCLA um, connecting the notion of stolen land with the need for abolition and also border imperialism. More glo globally, I think we're seeing um, concepts of eco-apartheid and, and, and I would love to hear you know, what, what Vish thinks about these kinds of framings. Um, eco-apartheid is put forward um, by Daniel Cohen. Um, the term climate apartheid has been advanced by Long and Rice. What, what these terms do is that they suggest that the geographies of carbon emissions, climate vulnerability, and carbon governance are all deeply colonial and racial in nature. And so there's a kind of twinned and a pairing of the way analytics are being deployed. Moving down the table, since I spoke about organized abandonment and sinks as being twin concepts already, I really wanna bring attention to the, the way the state has been conceptualized. And in a great piece um, called Stating the Obvious by Ruth uh, Gilmore and Craig Gilmore, um, they talk about the anti-state state, state right? The state, the neoliberal state that's basically gutted out in terms of welfare, in terms of care, in terms of social protection, and advanced in terms of militarism, carceriality, right? And here we can think about the prison industrial complex and the fossil fuel industrial complex as sort of manifestations of this anti-state state, right? But I should stress that these are not simply parallel formations of state corp and corporate power, but more often than not, they're overlapping forms of state power. From Houston to, to Detroit, to New Orleans, to Salt Lake City, Fossil fuel industries like Chevron and publicly traded energy companies like Exelon also fund police foundations, right? They fund surveillance technologies. They fund the use of, 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 of body cameras and other ways um, of, of that the surveillance state deploys. So, you know, these forms of state power are, are actually mutually reinforcing. And finally, um, because we're short on time, I, I, I want to um, emphasize um, uh, one really key parallel that I'm really excited about, um, and that's the divest invest call, right? Um, I think in, in the ways in which these, these parallel um, and also mutually reinforcing movements um, seek to kind of break down um, and, and divest from infrastructures of racial violence, 
they also seek to reinvest in infrastructures of life, care, renewal, and repair. And I think that it's interesting that both movements call this just transition, right? The, 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 the notion of just transition is exa exactly the same and, and echoed by both movements. Healthy schools, healthy neighborhoods, healthy border regions that don't invest in carceral and fo fossil capital, that don't cage, that don't detain, that don't treat some humans as expendable, right, is, is what the goal is here. And finally, both movements eschew tinkering around the edges, demanding instead structural anti-capitalist change or what the abolitionists love to call non-reformist reforms, which I, which I really uh, I really like as a concept. So to end, there is no climate justice, I think, without abolition in the most capacious of senses. This is nothing short of converging programs for remaking and rehumanizing the world. Thank you. Well, why don't you go ahead and uh, let Vish know that he's up next, Professor Shankar. Okay. So thank you again, Malini. And Vish, you're up. Hey, um, well, uh, thank you to Jennifer Chan, uh, Prof. Kian uh, Go for this uh, convening uh, together with your other institutional partners. And, and thank you to Prof. Malini Ranganathan for a very stimulating and, and thought-provoking input. And there's a lot to, to sort of talk about on this platform. I'm going to jump straight to my slides. Um, Okay, is that visible to everybody? All right. Yes. So um, we were told to kind of reference in <clears throat> our kind of uh, academic and intellectual work around how we engage uh, race, racism, and anti-racism, uh, but also kind of bring in some of the kind of practical side to activism, uh, but adding in a kind of dialogue with sort of Black Lives Matter. So thank you for that brief. Um, so I'm situated and I'm in South Africa. So, I mean, I'm going to come at this from, from where I'm located. So in the South African context, um, as you all know, I mean, you know, apartheid has been one of these important points of reference in the 20th century imagination, uh, emblematic of deep institutional and systemic racism and so on, sort of a pariah uh, of the world uh, in the 20th century. But we are now over 20 years into our post-apartheid democracy. And the South African case provides some very interesting insights around how to really grapple with the race, racism, anti-racism challenge. Uh, the particular volume I have flashed up here is part of a collective intellectual project, uh, Racism After Apartheid, uh, provocatively titled. And, and the point here is, is that we were trying to work out, and it's part of the Democratic Marxism series, and it was trying to work out a kind of re-racializing of post-apartheid South Africa, but also the world. Uh, we're living through a period in history where we are seeing the second coming of fascism, and we are seeing border complexes thrown up. Um, we see, well, with Trump, we had the wall project and so on and so on. And Du Bois kind of cautioned us about this color line in the early 20th century. But the thing about, about doing conjunctural analysis to understand, if you like, racial capitalism helps us understand how this color line is, if you like, fractured, uh, how it has specificities over time, okay? Uh, and this is very, very important. And so using that analytic of conjunctural analysis helps us to have a much richer grasp of how racializing logics uh, and relations are patterned and so on. We cannot think in terms of the colonial form of racism um, circa 1492 and use the dynamics of that time to understand what we are living through today. Uh, and I think this is this is very, very important uh, in how we've been grappling with this challenge. At the same time, the category of primitive accumulation and ecocide has been very, very important, even in our climate justice activism. Now, this idea of primitive accumulation relates to, you know, the originary moment of capitalism, uh, but it hasn't stopped there, as David Harvey has, has taught us, if you like. Uh, and it's been, it's, it's been in our present, uh, together with possession. But I prefer to use the term ecocide uh, to actually capture this historical process, because ecocide is really about the destruction of human and non-human nature. 
and it's been in the making in the, in in the context of if you like periodized capitalism from military mercantile capitalism to competitive victorian capitalism to monopoly industrial capitalism and today uh, with globalizing um, monopoly capitalism actually so it, it's it's a very important uh, concept to kind of locate this destructive logic of wiping out the conditions that sustained life so at one 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 point in time it was the other um, it was women and of course it was it was non-human nature that could be obliterated and there's a long history to this but i think the idea of ecocide is very very important in how we're thinking about um, con contemporary conjunctural uh, dynamics now in south africa we have a long tradition of grappling with racism uh, and anti-racism from within the Marxist tradition. Actually, you cannot understand the politics of anti-colonial struggles, uh, particularly in the African context, without understanding the place of Marxism. Uh, it has marked, if you like, the liberation movements of the 20th century, including in South Africa. And the national question framing <clears throat> has, if you like, been anchored in different analytics uh, historically, whether it's of racial capitalism, uh, whether it's about colonial capitalism or colonialism of a special type or articulations of modes of production, et cetera. So we have a very rich inheritance of theoretically and analytically trying to make sense of our society uh, and using the tools, if you like, of Marxism. And this is also guided, uh, if you like, politics in South Africa. The intervention we've made is to really kind of take us beyond the productivist understanding of the national question. Because the Marxism of national liberation in South Africa has not had an ecological basis to it, okay? It's very much a 20th century uh, Marxism um, that is really kind of uh, occludes, if you like, in its imagination, a conception of nature and so on. So this intellectual intervention is to say, let's rethink this national question uh, and let's actually displace it with the ecocide question, given the worsening climate crisis. In this context, there's an attempt to retrieve radical non-racialism. Now, on the face of it, the concept of non-racialism uh, in its most simplistic, uh, refers to, you know, being colorblind and so on. But actually, in the context of the national liberation tradition, prior to the democratic breakthrough of 94 in South Africa, radical non-racialism was, if you like, the deep philosophy uh, of anti-racist politics. And it lived in the streams of struggle in South Africa in different ways. It was existential phenomenology where activists recognized that they were born into racist societies, a racist society. We were all engineered to be racists, okay? Uh, black or white. But at the same time, we had to confront this in us, okay? And that was a very crucial starting point for the non-racial tra uh, tradition, if you like, of overcoming that racist in all of us. At the same time, it was also a basis for, uh, if you like, solidarity. Uh, Angela Davis, your pain is my pain and vice versa, right? This was very, very crucial uh, for the non-racial tradition and it built strategic convergences across race groups, et cetera. So uh, the other point about radical non-racialism is that it was anchored in a critique of capitalism. Now, after 1994, the official non-racialism that we've seen in the Mandela era, what is, what is liberal rainbowism and so on, has completely expunged, if you like, radical non-racialism. Uh, and so there's a, there's a kind of liberal nationalism that has prevailed since 94 in South Africa. And we are trying to retrieve that in the context of climate justice politics, because we really do believe, and I think this is where, if you like, some of the abolitionist position is very important. We've got to go to the roots of the problem. Uh, and, and if we don't do that, the systemic basis uh, of the reproduction of ecocide, et cetera, we're not gonna solve this problem. And then of course, there's a second coming of fascism, uh, which I've alluded to. And I, you know, Malini has mentioned Trump and Trumpism still living, uh, but Trumpism in the White House, ironically continued fracking, which was set up under your first African-American president. Uh, and Obama was a neoliberal and he essentially um, cranked up fracking. And the point about the global climate crisis 
is that everything is connected. It's a planetary problem. So as you had your fracking boom in the United States, it has had deleterious impacts for us in the rest of the world. Now, that's not to say South Africa is innocent. It's the 11th highest carbon emitter in the world. It actually owes a climate debt even to our own continent. But Trump, of course, continued that. Now, the slide I have in front of you comes from a collaboration in my Emancipatory Future Studies project with some of the leading climate scientists in the country. Some of them uh, are at my university. And the challenge I put to them was, how do we translate climate science, which we hear about in the IPCC reports and so on, to our specific context? And what was intriguing once they rose to the challenge was that we came to realize yeah. That Southern Africa, because of bad geography being south of the equator and so on, is heating at twice the global average. It is a climate hotspot, one of 10 on the planet. What that means is if we had 1.2 degrees Celsius globally, we are actually at 2.4 degrees. What this also means is that in this decade, as we move towards 1.5 degree overshoot, we are going to be at 3 degrees Celsius. Now, the climate science is also cautioning us that at three degrees Celsius, life in Southern Africa is going to become more and more unlivable. And that's within a short horizon of time. And it's a very, very scary reality that we are facing. So of course, if we breach two degrees, we are facing four degrees in Southern Africa. Now, this is climate justice writ large in front of you. The climate science is telling us this, that the more eco-fascism continues on our planet, the more carbon is extracted and emitted and so on, well, it's going to obliterate life. And in the context of Africa, the most vulnerable and those least responsible for this problem. Now, it's in this context, I'd like to just maybe say a few words around um, sort of climate justice and black lives and just sort of just maybe quickly draw some parallels. Um, so we've been living through the worst drought in our history uh, in South Africa uh, since circa 2014. And in that context, uh, you know, we've deployed subaltern analysis to try and understand what's happened here. And subaltern analysis for us is about looking at class and class helps us to look vertically. Uh, who's ruling and what are they doing? What are the powerful forces doing? So we connected the dots and at one point in time, it was Obama and then it was Trump. Uh, cranking up uh, sort of fossil fuel extraction and so on. But it also gets you to look below. And in the South African context, um, uh, it's really about the disproportionate impacts on workers and the poor and so on. Now, we also have experienced some of the worst uh, cyclonic activity in Southern Africa uh, over the past five years. Uh, we've had Cyclone Idai and Kenneth. Over 3 million people impacted in Mozambique, in um, Zimbabwe, uh, and, and so on. And it has had devastating consequences, mainly for women and children. Uh, and the recovery there is still, if you like, uh, very, very slow. And it may not happen. So what we are seeing is, if you like, climate destruction uh, and collapse. And it's not given that there's going to be a rebuilding that comes out of all of this. And again, you see climate injustice registered in the disproportionate impacts that we've experienced. But in the midst of all of this, we've seen a third cycle of resistance, um, what we call one degree Celsius movements. The climate justice charter movement started out of this drought, uh, but alongside Standing Rock in the United States, Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future. And this is the third cycle of resistance, which for us is very, very important. In parallel to this, of course, is, is, is Hurricane Katrina and, uh, you know, the kind of revelation that comes out there. Uh, and Malinini did a very interesting kind of perspective on a very local uh, racialized community in Washington. But Katrina, for us, looking from the outside in, also revealed, if you like, the continuities uh, of a racialized order in, in the United States. And again, subaltern analysis was very important to connect this all up. And we, and you know, locating Katrina, locating, uh, if you like, uh, climate justice resistance uh, has been very, very important for us. But there is a question, given Black Lives Matter's emergence after this and in the wake of this uh, and, sun, and the Sunrise Movement about whether these things are converging. And, I, and I'll just come back to say something about that quickly. Now, emancipatory futures 
for us. And I think this, this, this Du Boisian dialectic is very, very important that Malini mentioned. It's not just about the negative, it is also about the positive. And in the context of activism and the frontiers of activism in South Africa, the People's Food Sovereignty Campaign has been very much about imagining a different kind of food system. Now, what you have on your screen is what is called the People's Food Sovereignty Act, which we took to our parliament in 2018, in the midst of our drought, where we had a process of trying to work out what kind of food system do we want that's different from the carbon controlled globalized industrial food system. And we grappled with all the basic elements of that from soil uh, to production, to consumption, the role of the state, et cetera. And we, we produce what is called the People's Food Sovereignty Act. And it's not about a state-centric vision of a food system. It's about a food system that's constructed by, from below. It's what we would call a democratic systemic reform. And this is about building that new uh, in interstitial spaces, in spaces outside of, uh, if you like, um, accumulation and so on. Alongside this is the Climate Justice Charter document, and I'm not really going to go into it, but just to say that alongside the People's Food Sovereignty Act, we began to realize over the past few years that we really need a compass. We need another vision. We need another way forward beyond the kind of carbon capitalism that we have in South Africa. And hence, imagining and envisaging a different kind of future took root. And we set up a methodology of, if you like, affirming that the subaltern can think that the subaltern has answers, if you like, for great scale transformation. And this is what the Climate Justice Charter is about. It's affirming that tacit knowledge. So you're not gonna read it and find the ideal academic definition of climate justice. But what you are going to find are perspectives from frontline movements that are fighting against extractivism, the life after coal campaign in South Africa, that are fighting on the, on the front lines of, um, water struggles in South Africa that are fighting at the front lines of, um, uh, if you like, gender-based violence in South Africa and so on. Just to highlight one thing, there's a principle in the Climate Justice Charter, uh, decolonization. And that's a very, very important principle. And it came from, again, those conversations even with students and fallists uh, in South Africa. And the idea of decolonization is very, very important in the context of the deep just transition that we want. We don't want to reproduce America. We don't want to reproduce the imperial eco side of America. And this is the challenge to the liberal Biden administration in the context of the climate crisis. Is America going to let us choose the society that we want? We don't want the high carbon footprints. We don't want the high ecological footprints of American society, which is some of the highest in the world. This for us is the materiality of decolon decolonization in the South African context. We want to be able to validate and de-link on our terms so that we can survive. And this is a very, very important idea for us in the context of, if you like, the global geopolitics of climate justice today. And then very quickly, just to say something about strategic disruption. Now we've seen a lot of, if you like, symbolic disruption happen uh, in this uh, cycle of resistance. Uh, Fridays for Future, Greta Thunberg, all very, very important. Ringing the bell loud on climate science and its urgency, et cetera, and we fully support that. We've also seen tactical disruption. You've seen in the Niger Delta, women stand up against the Shell Corporation over decades and push it back, okay? You've seen this also in places like Ecuador and so on. But there's also space for strategic disruption. And strategic disruption for us is about the abolition of ecocidal capitalism. Because if we do not get rid of it, we are in its end game, it's going to end all of us. It's as simple as that, okay? Now, in the South African context, the end of a, or the struggle against apartheid was an abolitionist struggle. It was about ending the most heinous racist regime that we've had, uh, if you like, in our planetary existence. Now, that struggle, by the way, um, made major breakthroughs and gains. And in 1994, as I said, we had our democratic breakthrough. We have a, a wonderful constitution. Um, and of course, the rulers went about racializing the dominant system. In other words, deracializing capitalism. And really, it hasn't succeeded. 
uh, we have one of the most unequal countries in the world in terms of income distribution, over 40% of our population below the poverty line and epidemiological neoliberalism, if you like, in the context of COVID-19 has revealed the hard underbelly of the African reality. Now, this is a black government that has been in power for over 20 years. And it really disrupts some of how we start thinking about nationalism, particularly, and liberal nationalism. And in the end, uh, we have a very fraught society, a very polarized society in many ways. We are seeing xenophobia coming to the fore, exclusionary African and exclusionary white nationalisms. And, and these are all part of a carbon-based capitalism. And the strategic question we are grappling in this context is what is required for a deep, just transition to sustain life, okay? How can we move beyond this? And this is where we are talking about a political project, the climate justice project. It's about science, it's about the climate uh, justice charter, it's about policies, it's about just transition building from below, food sovereignty pathways, a universal basic income grant. These are all existing struggles right now on the frontiers in South Africa. But this has a very interesting parallel, if you like, in the, in the US context. So, you know, we had over 100 years of modern nationalism trying to abolish uh, apartheid in South Africa. From the American Civil War up until the mid 60s, uh, you had a very, very important struggle. But after that struggle and its victories in the mid 60s, what happened? And, and it's kind of, it's the question we are grappling with as well. What happened in the post-apartheid period? So it seems that there was an incorporation of a few in the US context. It seems that there's been securitization, exclusion and incarceration for the many. And so the racial divide was not really fully resolved in that context, like it is in South Africa today. So there's some very, very interesting parallels here. And, and what that means. And I, can, I think, again, coming back to the question of the convergence between Black Lives Matter and climate justice forces. Because for us, that's the frontier in which radical non-racialism has to come together. That is to be the glue that brill, builds the bridges, if you like, for the kinds of resistance we need for a new political project, grounded in a resistance to eco-fascism, uh, building these systemic alternatives that displace carbon lock-ins and build the new systems, if you like, emancipatory futures pathways in our everyday lives, uh, food systems that can feed us, water commoning that we can control, and so on. Uh, and, and of course, embracing and constituting forms of power that we create. If we build food sovereignty systems, we control our food system. That became very, very clear during COVID-19 for us. Uh, we went into COVID-19 with 14 million people hungry. <clears throat> we are now at about 30 million people food stress. We also know in the American context, hunger has gone up. Again, revealing that a corporate control food system is not where the answers lie. So ultimately, I think my message here today is that radical non-racial unity, together with struggles against other forms of oppression, is how we see the challenge. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, Vish. And uh, Jenny, do you have anything to say, or should I uh, should I move forward? Sure. Why don't you go ahead and uh, ask a couple questions? I have uh, questions also from the students, which I will text you. Okay. Perfect. So welcome, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. My name is Kian Go, and I'm an assistant professor of urban planning at UCLA. So a uh, dear friend and colleague with uh, Jennifer. And thank you so much to Vishwas and to Malini for your presentations. I think together they put forth a, a, a totally critical range of issues and sites that we all need to be thinking of right now. So I'll just, my work, I've been studying the, the spatial politics of urban climate change responses. And I've been studying a variety of sites, primarily in the US, so in New York, post-Hurricane Sandy, in Jakarta, Indonesia, 
a city that confronts chronic flooding and tracing some of the ideas, the flows of ideas and influence among these sites with other places such as Rotterdam in the Netherlands often cited as a kind of model for, uh, for, for, climate, for climate adaptation primarily. And so what strikes me as, in, as really the top line uh, uh, issue of, of importance here is how we look, I apologize, there will be some sounds from the background, um, how we look from the transnational interconnected nature of things that 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 clearly we must when we look when we, we're trying to understand climate change and climate struggles and the very place based and historically specific nature of how uh, inequalities are produced in different places so for instance so both malini and vishwas talk from particular places and in fact vishwas you, you started by saying where you are situated, that it's really important that you're speaking from uh, South Africa and you're conducting analysis from South Africa. And Malini, your points about particular neighborhoods, wards in DC and, and, and the, the, the difference in, of how uh, particular inequalities are constituted in those places was like totally, totally critical to how you understand the whole problem. And so for me, the main question is how do we, how do we balance these two things? So I, I, I'll, I'll say a few things about what, what I thought was so gripping and then post just one question, I think, because we 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 I love to to foreground the the questions for the for the students. Mm -hmm. So the first is, if we think that place based, historically specific context matters, then what are the modes of organizing? Are do we have to do? in order to make these relationships between places like South Africa or even you know, other countries of the global South that are not, that don't admit half as much as South Africa might, uh, and places like DC where the struggles are so real, but they are contained within uh, a nation state structure that is continuing to be uh, you know, the leading or at least like the top three leading global um, global carbon emitters in the in the world. So Vish, you said, quote, is America going to let us choose the society we want if we had these ideas of a radically decarbonized future? Historically, the, that answer has been no. Whenever alternatives, primarily in South, South America and other places have come up, alternative societies that do not conform to the kinds of uh, liberal capitalist state that, that our government would like to see everywhere, uh, they've been snuffed out in, in so many ways. And so how do we, that, that continues to be a problem even in our better case scenario today than last week. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I, yeah, how do, we, how do we conduct those modes of organizing to, to get us to a place where, where uh, climate justice struggles in the US don't continue to have del deleterious effects in other places? And then so the, my second broad, um, question is really what are the kinds of methods that uh, that scholars who who want to work with activists on the ground and feel it's entirely necessary to work with and for activists on the ground? Uh, how, how do we do our work? So Malini, I know that for you uh, and for Eve, you mentioned your collaboration with Eve Bradman. It was based on very fine grain. Uh, collaborations with residents and with activists who understand their own histories, their own uh, daily lives in order to really place their struggles within a broader, uh, this broader context of, of, 
of, of climate struggles and, and urban development and urban resilience. Are those the kinds of methods that we have to continue doing? And, and, and then in, in, that, in, in that case, how, how, you know, I don't wanna say scale up because I think scaling up is a, a kind of presumes one particular way to do this, but how do we build a more mass movement if each of our moments of knowledge production have to be so embedded and so local? Like, are we envisioning a kind of like global transnational uh, co-productive movement of very localized collaborations between scholars and activists? Like, it sounds amazing to me, but also like a, a pretty, pretty big hurdle. Um, so, so what are the kinds of methods, both the kinds of actions we take on the ground to, know, to, to understand struggles in place and more broadly uh, our, our, our ways of knowing and, and, and aligning them across the disparate power relationships, not only in our cities, but across continents. So, so those, uh, those are my, my, main, my main observations. Uh, maybe one, so one concrete question. What do you think, either of you, are some, some concrete organized modes of organize, organizing and movement building that you see uh, that could help us move beyond some of, the, some of these uh, gaps, both in terms of knowledge production and in terms of scale? Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Well, thank you uh, for those observations. I, I think for me implied in your set of comments and questions um, is an overarching question about how we move from the particular to the general, right? How we, how we sort of connect the, um, the observations and the embeddedness of a particular research programs that are situated in place, whether it's South Africa or Washington DC um, with a kind of global solidarity building, um, particularly when sometimes we're speaking from so-called centers of power. And, and I think I think I think here the the issue of of really recognizing that there are global Souths within the global north and that there's there's a real um, a reckoning with the fact that you know what black radicals talked about uh, 60 years ago of the sort of internally colonial nature of some of the places um, that we speak that we speak from right and so for me DC is very em emblematic of what um, black uh, radicals were talking about in the 60s black Marxists about the internally colonial nature of the United States and then and then and then those types I mean we haven't seen the types of civil rights anti-colonial struggles that we saw in the 1960s we haven't seen them since so there is this kind of return to thinking across the color line. I love the way that Vish talked about that drawing from Du Bois's work, right? The global color line. I think we're really in a moment of, of return to some of the narratives from the 1960s, which, which sought to connect quote unquote third world peoples within empires, right? Within, uh, within so-called democratized uh, countries um, with, with those that were still colonized. And I think, I think that that sort of general impulse is, is something that we're seeing kind of resurgence of today. And, and that, that gives me a sort of hope and inspiration. I think that I didn't see at least when I was, when I was growing up, you know, throughout the, 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 the 90s and the early 2000s, there was a sort of this end of history triumphalism and, and there was not this sense of, of solidarity. So, um, so, so first of all, I, I, it's not sort of how do we, I think it's already happening, Kian. I think that, that, that it's not that, you know, we're, we're thinking here, how, how do we build a solidarity? I think they're really happening. And I've seen them already happen, you know, just connecting, for instance, uh, Black Lives Matter to Dalit Lives Matter in India, to other types of, um, you know, um, rehumanizing impulses that are going on. And, and for me, um, seeing those articulations happen in different places, um, not necessarily in the exact same way, right? So, so even the concept of environmental justice, climate justice, environmental racism, abolition look different from the standpoint of India than they do from DC. But necessarily when you're speaking about a particular place, 
it's it's you're speaking with that comparative impulse. So even though Vish is speaking from South Africa and, and in my comments I'm speaking from DC, it is a comparative move to then to then um, speak from, right? Um, because because you're necessarily connecting, I think. Um, so I, I mean, I'll just start there because I, I think I, I saw that sort of urgency of trying to connect the particular with the general in your comments, but, but I think it really is happening already and it's up to scholars to sort of follow that lead. I can just make uh, three quick points. Um, I mean, just to go back to, to the kind of defeat of pan-Africanism, actually, in the African context, it's a very, very important for us to register this in this conversation. And actually, it was defeated um, in the context of a hegemonic US after World War II, uh, which you know was partly responding to the rising civil rights movement and therefore pushed a decolonizing, a decolonizing agenda, ironically, largely because of domestic pressure. Uh, but that decolonizing agenda really wasn't about transformation in the world. So the US turned its back on French and British and other empires. But in the, in the African context, the kind of radical impulses of Pan-Africanism, whether it was uh, African socialism, uh, whether it was African scientific socialism, et cetera, was physically destroyed. Okay, so you had um, coups, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, you had assassinations, Patrice Lumumba, et cetera. And as the kind of Cold War unfolded in the 20th century, we became a major battleground in Southern Africa. Uh, Angola became a crucial front line of the Cold War. I mean, Reagan you know, kicked in everything into Angola, okay? So Pan-Africanism was largely defeated uh, in the African context. And the US played a very important role in defeating Pan-Africanism. And I think it's very, very important just to underline that. And I think part of the kind of, if you like, academic project has to also recover uh, a critical historiography of these moments in history. We've got to learn from the past. We're not starting from scratch. Uh, and I think this is why for us in the South African context today, as we are building and, 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 and thinking about a different kind of society, we are asking ourselves, well, <clears throat> will Imperium allow us to survive? Okay, this is a very fundamental question and it's, it, it is grounded in the history of emancipation and liberation in Africa. The second point I'll make is about movements. And so I really think that uh, we think hard beyond the cliche of, kind of think global, act local, and, um, and this idea that you know, crowd politics is enough uh, to kind of unite us, you know, sort of the global assembly and things like that, all very important. I actually, we don't have a climate justice movement uh, that, in, that is institutionalized at a global scale. We don't have it. Uh, you have uh, versions of Extinction Rebellion. You have versions of Fridays for Future. They land everywhere. They translate everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have a global climate justice movement. It meets alongside the COP summits and so on. So we are actually at the frontier of rethinking internationalism again. And this is very, very important for us, I think. And, and you know, here the literatures around movement building uh, and social movement literature and so on. I mean, what I know of the American literature on this, it really doesn't help us uh, around thinking beyond kind of resource-based theories on movements, et cetera. We're really at a different frontier here uh, around internationalism and movement building. And so, we need a, a kind of different research agenda. And the politics that's coming out um, in these kinds of movements are profoundly transformative. They do not fit into the kind of uh, political categorizations that we have in political science or social movement theory, et cetera. Uh, the, the last point I'll make is that um, I really do think we need a different theory of capitalism today. And this is a very important challenge for critical social theory, for radical social theory. Uh, we are actually dealing with the capitalism and I have been alluding to it, ecocide, I've been using that concept. Uh, capitalism today is destroying uh, our life world um, and the evidence is there and I'm not being hysterical about this. You can look at the IPPC reports, you can look at the International Panel on Biodiversity and System Services. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a plethora of international studies uh, alluding to, if you like, uh, flashing lights of destruction on a planetary scale. 
So I think that a theory of capitalism um, that captures uh, this dynamic is very, very important. And I think this is where a kind of organic knowledge of activism, but also the hard edge theorizing of the academy, the radical academy becomes important. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. So I'll, I'll just make one follow-up comment. Malini, I think you are correct that there are emerging solidarities that are, are, are new and, and, and I think productive. There, there, there are things that we would like to see and we would like to understand more. And still like one of the things that worries me is when we see the structure of American cities and the structure of the American, the, the, the nation state, we can fight for almost like radical redistribution of investments in places like Ward 7 in DC or in some of the sites I've looked at in places like Red Hook in Brooklyn. And yet, do hardly anything to the to the ways in which the the U.S. and other countries, such as uh, alongside the U.S., continue to dominate uh, dominate both the 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 factors of climate change, the actual emissions, but also the structures through which uh, those factors are are unequal and increasing. So certainly touching in connection to what Vish just said, yeah, a rethinking of, of capitalism more broadly. And as well, I think the I think a really um, useful reminder about where the climate justice movement is globally at the moment. So like I, I offhand talk about like a globalizing climate justice movement, but perhaps we should also recognize where uh, such a movement is limited to the, the, the its own institutional limitations at the moment, if only you know alongside the COP meetings. So thank you, and let's uh, turn to some questions from uh, from the from the from the viewers. So I have one to me from that that Jenny has sent to me. So for Vish, so. You state in your article in the climate crisis that Donald Trump expanded fossil fuel pipeline, pipeline development, such as the Keystone XL, rolled back Obama's climate uh, modest clean power plan, weakened the EPA, and withdrew the US from the Paris Agreement. And this is the question, even in the Obama administration, the modest interventions that were implemented didn't have the support of the ruling class. So how do you think the current president, Joe Biden's administration will tackle these issues, not only enacting the policies, but implementing them within a nation where the ruling class still does, does not, by and large, support green alternatives at a time when these actions are even more crucial than in the years of the Obama administration. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for that question. Excellent question. I mean, I think it's very important for us to situate uh, this moment in history. Um, and there's different social thinkers that can help us do this. I mean, Karl Polanyi um, and his work on the Great Transformation is very, very important uh, in this conversation. And, uh, you know, Polanyi, uh, he wrote his text in um, 1944, okay, after World War II. And he was ringing the alarm bell about unleashing marketization in the late 19th century, which, which gave us World War I. And then of course, in the interwar years uh, where the gold standard was reinstated uh, and it was kind of a humdrum free marketeering, et cetera, et cetera. And it ended up in uh, World War II. Uh, we had the great depression in between all of that. Uh, now that's one way of thinking about this moment of history. There's an historical analog here. But I actually think that there's something more complex about this historical moment. And, and you know, marketization is part of it. There have been four big crises of capitalism over the past 150 years, the late 19th century, the interwar years, 
in the early 70s and now, circa, if you like, 2007. But each crisis has to be understood on its own terms. Each crisis has its own specificities and its own dynamics. The current crisis that we are living through is actually deeply systemic on the one hand. So you've got the climate problem, you've got resource peaks, uh, you've got hunger, uh, you've got the hollowing out of democracy, but you also have a crisis of a political project. So neoliberalism is becoming more and more authoritarian because it cannot govern the, the unequal, if you like, and so on. So you have a very deep and profound crisis at this point in time. And I think it's very, very important for us to keep this in mind. It's a civilizational crisis. It is unprecedented in history. Now to come to the specifics of your question, this is the, this is the scale of the challenge, uh, even to the Biden administration. Now within the American ruling classes, there's been a divide and, and Trump has accentuated that divide. Uh, before Trump, Biden and Obama um, kind of, you know, continued the kind of neoliberal project from Clinton going back to Reagan, et cetera, and, and, and accelerated financialization of American society, uh, increased, if you like, uh, carbon and so on and so on. Biden was part of that project, but there's been something intervening between all of that. The first has been the horror of Trump's uh, plutocratic neo-fascism, which I think has shaken up if you like, the, the liberal uh, faction of the ruling class in the United States. I think the second thing that has happened is real climate shocks inside the United States. I mean, it's tragic when we all look at what's happening on the planet. We're seeing the wildfires in California. We're seeing the hurricanes uh, devastating the United States. We're seeing flooding in the United States, etc. Nobody can ignore that. The climate science is very, very serious right now around the urgency, the 2018 IPCC report, but subsequent studies, we're entering the sixth cycle of reporting. And right now the climate models <laughs> that, are, that people are working with are showing greater urgency for action. Um, so I think, uh, and then lastly, I think the fact that a group of activists in your society, the Sunrise Movement, I think uh, eco-socialists inside the Democratic Party like Bernie Sanders, uh, AOC, et cetera, all of these factors have impacted, in my view, from where I'm sitting, on how Biden has to grapple with this historical moment. Now, um, I really think that if, uh, and this is going to be a very, very serious test. Um, I mean, it's not just a question of reacting to Trump. It's a question of whether a political project can come to the fore that can provide answers to these deep systemic crises, this crisis of civilization. And I think there the jury is out. I mean, there's a good start with, re, you know, rewinding, if you like, or erasing some of the damage with executive orders, et cetera. Um, and of course, you face the big challenge of COVID destruction and, and harm in the United States. Um, but uh, the big picture thinking uh, still has to reveal itself. Uh, the big propositions, the big policy agendas, I think still has to come to the fore. Um, and I think we all are, are hopeful uh, that it'll, it'll, it'll open space, hopefully on a planetary scale. Thanks. Thank you, Vish. So we have another question for Malini. This, I believe is also is a student question. So in order to reimagine resilience or following your critique of resilience, Malini, uh, you suggest that we shift our focus from understanding the various factors that produce and reinforce harms instead of blaming individuals via societal expectations. Thus, we must adopt an abolitionist praxis to achieve environmental justice and equity. So if state development programs are harmful, like the single family housing programs, for instance, can we go around working with the state to achieve justice, even though all of our policies, or at least many of our policies, have been deeply rooted in injustices produced by the nation state? And if so, how? So I, if I'm understanding um, that question correctly, it, it's, it's basically asking for how do, we, how do we think about the role of the state in bringing about abolition when in fact the state has been so complicit 
in the kind of infrastructures of violence and that I spoke about, and also um, in the ways in which um, you know resilience itself has been used as a sort of technocratic um, uh, planning. Uh, tool for accumulation in which consultants are deployed, et cetera, and, and, and people aren't actually benefiting. So how is how is the state to be thought of as a partner here when in fact it's it's so much the source of harm? Um, and and I and I think that's a really, really pertinent question. I think that one of the things that I keep coming back to again and again when I think about the state is how um, you know how richly theorized the state has been in post-colonial literature, especially uh, literature on the on, in anthropology on on, on the post-colonial state, because one of the major takeaways is that the state is not a unitary actor, right? It's a highly heterogeneous, highly internally contentious, internally contradictory actor. Um, and, and in fact, abolitionists have also recognized this. So here's, here's where I think, again, right? People coming at this from very different vantages with very different activist agendas are recognizing the state is not a unitary actor. And therefore, what are the leverage points within the state Right? What are the places of maneuver within the state that enable a more kind of radical approach to change? Right. So, so even thinking about sort of the arms of the state that deal with housing, it turns out that um, the that a particular um, um, arm of the state that tries to ensure tenant protections, such as the the arm of the state that advanced the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act in D.C., is actually you know very very um, pro. Uh, de decommodifying housing and taking it out of the market so that it can be accessed um, by by people who um, you know who are uh, marginalized and so I think I think for me I'll just leave it as, at, at that at that sort of answer which was we we cannot think of the state as homogenous. Thank you, thank you, Malini, and actually a, uh, maybe a, a follow up to that because because of your work in different settings, thinking about your work in South Asia. So we have a, a question from Kimberly Thomas. Uh, so given your work in places like India, uh, can you help us see how an abolitionist approach might also be applied to those contexts? Yeah, I think this is this is a really, really important question. And, and thank you, Kimberly, for that, because it's the one that I think I'm grappling most with. Um, in terms of, you know, we, as you said, there's been emergent ways in which solidarity building has happened, right? Um, and, and certainly, it's not a cohesive movement. But, but um, I, I think I think we have to think about this um, historically and theoretically, right? So when you look at at um, uh, it from the man from the vantage of Marxist history, or whether you look at it from the vantage of Foucault's political genealogy, or from the vantage of post-colonial theory, I think it's clear that the birth of prisons and the police has always had a very comfortable relationship to the expansion of liberal capitalism and liberal imperialism, right? That, that's a really important starting point for thinking abolition more globally, right? So, so if in particular, if you read the work of Marxist historians, right, like Peter Leinbaugh, you will see that policing and prisons are necessary to the privatization of land, right? Uh, and to the institution of private property. So if you start there, Right. If you start from that really important starting place, um, then then you see that notions of criminality, right? Who is a criminal, right? Is is a really really sort of shifting social construct that is uh, deployed in the service of capital accumulation, in the service of protecting property, um, and and so then you start to see well, even in places like India, where abolition per se is not the rubric through which people are articulating. Right, problems with criminalization, it, cr nevertheless, there is a movement against the criminalizing of the poor, the criminalizing of queer uh, groups, the criminalizing of sex workers, the criminalizing right, of the urban informals. Um, and, so, and so for me, there's, there is a really important abolitionist impulse embedded in the pushback against how we define criminalization, you know, particularly now with the Hindu uh, nationalist state, the criminalization of Muslims and of lower caste groups um, is really something that we're seeing. And that's really the strong arm of the police, um, which of course comes from the strong arm of the, of the colonial police state um, that is deputed there. So for me, I think that's a really important place to start to thinking about abolition more transnational. Thank you, Melanie. So we have another question for, for Vish. So this is 
from Theo Wicklin, who is a PhD candidate in, in urban planning here. So this plan and approach to climate justice and food sovereignty that, that you talked about seems very compelling. However, it also seems very modern in its modes of rational analysis, universality, human centrism slash supremacy and basis in quantitative science. So to put you into conversation with scholars on modernity or coloniality who have argued that modern epistemologies and ontologies are inherently colonial, have you considered approaches or strategies which would deliberately engage more diverse, uh, quote, more than modern ways of knowing and theories of reality? That's an excellent question. I just want to start off first by, um, again, locating uh, Marxism in this conversation, um, because it's, it's very, very important for us to kind of, if you like, um, understand that, that Marxism, as it's traveled in the 20th century and in struggles and so on, uh, has been indigenized. But more than that, um, it has actually um, challenged even the epistemological moment of racism in Marx. And that was a very brief moment, you know, where he was waxing lyrical about the expansion of capitalism and how good it is, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and beyond 1852, uh, Marx becomes much more careful in how he's thinking about colonialism and its deleterious impacts and the expansion of capitalism on a global scale. There's increasing evidence uh, about how he rethought uh, his whole framework, if you like. So I just want to I just want to park that point because it's very very important. Um, this and but deriving from that, which is also important, I think what Marxism does give us is this idea of universals from the subaltern, and this is important: the exploited subaltern, but not just the worker, the industrial white worker. Okay. Uh, a Marxism that is not class reductionist can appreciate universals from the subaltern more generally, uh, fighting oppressions. And I think this is, this is also important to park in the conversation. This brings me then to the kind of decolonial critique because I do think it's very, very important. Um, and I do think that um, the idea of, uh, if you like, pluriepistemologies is very, very important and other ways of knowing, other ways of being, and so on. And the idea of pluriversality is important because here you can affirm, uh, it's, it's, it's my clumsy way of saying many universals, okay? Um, and, and, and allowing a different kinds of knowledge to contest and engage, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in the South African context, in the way we are engaging in our activism and how we are doing, including in the Democratic Marxism series, uh, the Democratic Marxism series is in dialogue with other bodies of knowledge. It doesn't start from the premise uh, that Marxism has all the ideas. It's not that dogmatic and closed. So if you engage with that body of work, you will find us in conversation with anarchists, uh, you'll find us in conversation, uh, including we had Occupy activists, right, in volume two, by the way. Uh, we, we, we were engaged in dialogue with um, uh, anti-racist activists that are not Marxist, uh, anti-caste activists, et cetera. And I think this is very, very important for where, where I'm, if you like, located in terms of a knowledge project uh, in the 21st century. It's very important to appreciate the radicalisms, uh, the anti-capitalisms, um, and if you like the epistemologies of other subaltern forces and to respect that and to work with that. In the context of food sovereignty campaigning, as you know, I mean, La Via Campesina is the largest planetary uh, movement, over 200 million members, uh, peasant-based, uh, small-scale family farming, etc. I mean, and its whole approach to knowledge, particularly agroecology, uh, is really, if you like, decolonial, okay? Uh, it's retrieving and it's recovering uh, indigenous knowledge as a science, as a people's science. Now that's exactly what we are also doing in the South African context. 
we are asking the question, well, what kind of agriculture we had before colonial uh, uh, capitalism in South Africa? Uh, how did African communities, uh, because they were for 2000 years engaged in agriculture in South Africa. And so we, we wanna retrieve some of that. There's indigenous knowledge there that's very, very important for our activism. Uh, retrieving that archive, retrieving that knowledge is, is very, very crucial. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I personally believe that um, the decolonial uh, option uh, is an option that we should definitely take seriously. Uh, we should engage with it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and this is where I'm critical of the Latin American school, we shouldn't disavow, uh, if you like, um, post-Eurocentric Marxisms that have grown up in the global South. Thanks. Thank you. So we are essentially out of time, and I want to give the final words to our two, to our two speakers. I do want to point out that there's a, a really interesting set of questions in the Q&A right now. Um, and and I, we won't, I won't ask you to answer this, but just to note that the questions are about the possibility of um, solidarity economies, questions about whether democratic eco-socialism can only happen in the absence of capitalism, questions about uh, the possibility of approaching climate justice as a procedural rather than a distributional question. Um, and also the time sensitive issue that I think we're also aware of, um, how, do we, how, we, how do we work for climate, uh, towards climate justice when even some of the more modest propositions that we've seen now uh, are taken as so provocative. So these are some of the things that are in the chat and um, I'm sorry that we won't be able to get to them, but I would like to give Malini and Vish, both of you some final thoughts for the students or for the attendees broadly. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I think one of the things, the themes that's really emerging from me here is something that Vish says about rethinking internationalism and what that would look like. I've, I've been staying with that for a while since he said that um, and, and trying to uh, think about, you know, to what extent did the models of the past serve us right now and to what extent do they not? And, and therefore then what are the patterns, the emerging patterns in the solidarity economy as the question rightly pointed out, as even Eric Shepard pointed out about distributive justice, right? What is the process by which we engage people with, with, with you know, non-traditional non-mainstream epistemologies, right? And I think there's something really there. There's a kernel right there, which is the sort of the beginnings of an answer for what a new internationalism would look like, right? A new internationalism wouldn't rely on the tropes and inherited theories and paradigms of the of the past solely, right? It would kind of re-envision and, and make theory as, as we're building those solidarities, right? In perhaps atypical ways. So I think so I think I'm I'm staying with that and I'm gonna that's gonna stay with me for a while. And, and you know, thank you for all the excellent questions that we didn't get to, but I think they're all part of this notion of sort of rethinking the the the, the process of solidarity building. Thank you. Thank you. Vish. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, th th theory and, and theorizing can also be an obstacle to building strategic unities. Um, you know, one of the dominant sort of concepts uh, in the US context is intersectionality, right? Going back to the Kahambi River Collective uh, and, and, and made, uh, uh, you know, famous by Kimberly Crenshaw, et cetera. And, uh, and, that, and that discourse lands differently in different parts of the world. Um, in the South African context, we have a history of theorizing our oppressions um, and uh, multiple oppressions and so on. And I think for me, the challenge is to revisit and rekindle, uh, and that's what the intellectual project I've been engaged in is all about, uh, is to rekindle those radical traditions uh, and to refine those resources, uh, but not in a way that is, if you like, against um, other radical ideas. So I, I really think that um, as we move forward, uh, we, we must keep this in mind, uh, that the other ways of um, 
conceptually and analytically thinking through the problem in different parts of the world. There are different inheritances, intellectual resources that are there, critical ones, critical social theory, et cetera. And we've got to find ways of building bridges um, and learning from each other. And I think in that way, we can overcome the intellectual barriers, uh, but also find ourselves at the common intellectual barricade. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this has been an incredibly uh, stimulating uh, and really insightful conversation that um, I think uh, many of us are pushed not only to really specify and understand the particularities of our moment and the kind of civilizational crisis uh, fish that you outlined, but also to pose um, some really urgent alternatives and to remember that, um, you know, um, we can't sort of turn our heads and we have to tackle this problem uh, together and with creativity uh, and thinking about our past and thinking about um, our collective futures. So thank you again. Um, I want to just briefly close by saying our next um, uh, webinar for the Black Lives Matter Global Perspective Series uh, from ethnography to ethnographic representing the work of the police with speaker Didier Hassan and discussions Asli Bali and our uh, boom will take place uh, this upcoming Friday so be sure to register and again uh, please join me in thanking Vishwasatkar, Malini Ranganathan and Kian Go for this really fabulous conversation. Thank you.